Thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. Today's podcast is from March 11th, 2018. Join us as we continue our study in the Gospel of John with Pastor Dax. So here we are still in the upper room uh, on the night before Jesus' death, and he gave this commandment to his disciples. Remember this? He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And then he says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That was back in chapter 13, right after he washed the disciples' feet. And then, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, in uh, chapter 15, verse 12, Jesus returns to this same idea again about love here. In this same conversation, same night, he says in verse 12 of chapter 15, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And then if you remember from last week, he goes on to give three illustrations of how he has loved us. Remember that? He says in verse 13, uh, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So he's saying, this is, this is how I've loved you. I'm going to die in your place. And then in verse 15, he says, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. So this is another way that I've loved you. I've, I've opened my heart to you and called you friends. And then he says in verse 15, uh, or sorry, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So this is yet another way I've loved you, Jesus says, by uh, choosing you and appointing you to go and take the message of the gospel to the world so that many might be saved. Now I wanted to, to recap all this talk here about love our love for one another and uh, the love that Jesus has for us because I don't, I don't think any of us would disagree that it is love that should be the distinguishing characteristic of a Christian. Love for each other ought to be right up there with our highest ambitions and our, and our loftiest goals as a church. Jesus makes it very clear that love for one another is of the most paramount importance. However, there's another feature that marks out those who follow Jesus Christ. Yes, Christians are defined by their love for one another, but what is equally true in the passage we just read is that authentic, genuine Christianity is also always distinguished by hatred from the world. So do we need a reality check on this this morning? Because scripture teaches that believers, true believers, will suffer persecution from the world. That Christianity attracts not affection, but antagonism from the world. And friendship on the part of a Christian with the world is evidence of a compromised Christianity, which is no Christianity at all. And here, in this passage, the night before his death, Jesus, he makes sure that his disciples are not going to be surprised by any of this. In fact, did you notice here, and, and if you go down to the end of the passage, all through verse 24, Jesus uses the word hate six times in these verses. Meseo, it, it means to abhor. It, it speaks of uh, deep-seated, uh, malicious feelings. It speaks of uh, intense aversion. I mean, it, it, it means hate in the strong sense of the word. So who's the object of this hatred? What I mean is, who's being hated here? Well, in this passage, and we'll look at the other verses next week, but we read that God the Father is being hated. 
We read that God the Son is being hated. And we read that Jesus' followers are being hated. So that's who's being hated. So who's doing all the hating? Well, in direct contrast, contrast to verse 17, where he mentions loving one another, look at what he says in verse 18. If the world hates you, the world, the world hates us? What does that mean? The world here means, quite simply, uh, the entire mass of sinful, unsaved humanity who are alienated from God, who are hostile to Jesus Christ and everything that he stands for. People who are in bondage to sin and who are enslaved to the prince of this world. That's who we're talking about. And it's from these people, Jesus says here, that we can expect, as his followers, hatred and hostility and persecution. Now, I know it says there, if the world hates you, which makes it sound like it's, it's just maybe a possibility that this could happen. And I don't want to get overly technical, but this, this little clause here is what's called a first-class condition, which just means, for the sake of argument, it's assumed to be true. So a better translation of this is probably, since the world hates you. Or, if the world hates you, and you know that it does, this follows. So there's nothing hypothetical about this, okay? Jesus isn't uh, talking about a possibility that one day, maybe the world might hate you. He's talking about something that is very real, very actual here. He's talking about a, a settled, uh, entrenched posture of hostility from the world directed toward believers that is already, at this very moment, taking place. And so keeping track here, given the fact that we will, that, that genuine believers will encounter hostility from the world, and that this hatred for Christians is one of the ways, uh, one of the things that identifies us as authentic Christians, then how should we handle it? How should we prepare for it? How do we deal with this animosity and this antagonism, this persecution, when it comes at us, what do we need to do to keep a, a proper perspective on persecution? I'm going to give you three things today, and we'll build on that next week. But the first thing I want us to keep in mind when persecution comes our way, the way to keep a right perspective, the way to prepare for it is, first of all, by realizing that the world's supreme hatred is reserved for Jesus Christ. The world's supreme ultimate hatred is reserved for Jesus Christ. He says in verse 18, since the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. And if you go down to verse 24, he says, if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and and my father. And again in verse 25. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me. Even the grammar uh, brings out just how complete this hatred is. Back in verse 18 where he says, know that it is hated me. That verb hated is in the perfect tense. Which means that it refers to this action that was done at a point in time. But it has ongoing ramifications, uninterrupted ramifications that extend into the present. What that means is this, this hatred here on the part of the world towards Christ is a settled and permanent state. So just how far back then does this hatred of Jesus Christ go? Well, even as he speaks these very words here in John 15... Judas is out there somewhere in the darkness carrying out his wicked plan. But that's not when this hatred started, is it? Back in John chapter 11, remember how Caiaphas, the high priest of Israel, said it's expedient for one man to die for the entire nation? And, and the leaders began plotting to kill him? But that wasn't anything new either. 
In John chapter 10, the religious leaders attempted to arrest and stone Jesus. Same thing in John chapter 8. In John chapter 7, the, the temple guard is sent out to arrest Jesus. In John chapter 5, during the first year of his public ministry, they sought to kill him. And that was just in and around Jerusalem. Up in Galilee, back in his own neck of the woods, things were just as hostile up there. Listen to the response to his first public sermon. He, he preaches one simple text, makes some application, and then Luke chapter 4 says, When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. There's a nice hometown welcome. This settled hatred for Jesus that he mentions in John 15, it was there from the very start of his ministry. And if you can see where I'm going with this, you realize that the hostility against Jesus began even earlier than that. At the age of two. And he's just learned to, to walk and talk. The very mention of his existence fills King Herod with such rage that he orders the execution of all the male babies in Bethlehem in an effort to kill the true king. That's how deep this hatred for Jesus runs. That's how settled it is. That's how permanent it is. In fact, the phrase that you see sometimes in scripture in reference to eternal judgment, gnashing of teeth, I think that lends itself to this idea that it paints this picture that sinners who have been left to themselves in hell will for all eternity be expressing anger toward the God who justly condemned, condemned them to that place. This hatred, it's not going anywhere. And so when it comes to us then, however it comes, we have to remember that the world's supreme hatred is not directed toward us, not really. It's first and foremost directed toward Jesus Christ. And it always has been, and it always will be. Which is incredible when you think about it, isn't it? I mean, Jesus, the embodiment of perfection, this man, Jesus, the, the revelation of glory. Jesus, the, the manifestation of God's love. God in the flesh, on earth, dwelling among us. How can he be the one whom the world hates so supremely? Well, back in John chapter 7, we get a hint. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but back in John chapter 7, if you, if you flip back there very briefly, uh, in John 7, this is when Jesus' brothers mock him, and uh, they sort of try to goad him into going up to Jerusalem to show himself at the Feast of Booths, which is almost a certain death sentence for him to do that at this time. And in John chapter 7, verse 6, Jesus says, my time has not yet come. So it's not time for him to die yet. This is not God's timetable. Then he says, but your time is always here. Now watch this. The world, there it is. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me. Why? Why, Jesus? Why does the world hate you? He continues, because I testify about it that its works are evil. You see it? The perfection of Jesus exposes the world for what it really is. Depraved and wicked and sinful. And the world does not tolerate that exposure. And so, even though we experience kind of the aftershocks of that hatred we have to realize that the world's supreme hatred is reserved for Jesus Christ. And that brings us to the second point here, back to John 15. Secondly, we have to realize when, we, when it comes to responding to persecution, to keeping a proper perspective on persecution, we have to realize that the world's hatred for us is stirred up by our, for lack of a better term, otherworldliness. 
the world's hatred for, for us as Christians is stirred up by our otherworldliness. So it's not just the loveliness of Jesus that provokes the hatred of the world. It's also the loveliness of Jesus that is displayed through his people that provokes the world's hatred. He says in verse 19, If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now there's sort of a strange phrase in there, right? That, that we are not of the world. What does that mean? I mean, after all, we're, we're born into this world. We, we live and, and grow up and, and die in this world. What does it mean that we are not of the world? Well, what he means is to, to be of the world is to be bound by the world. It's to be wrapped up in the world's philosophy. It's to be uh, driven by the world's ambitions. It's to share those things in common. And Jesus tells his men, and by extension us, all believers, we've been removed from all of that. That's not us anymore. And since that's true, that means that conflict then is going to be inevitable with the world. How could it not be? People of the world are focused on earthly things, on things that are seen, on things that are temporary. They don't fear God. They don't love God. They hate God. They love themselves. They're driven by sin and sinful desires. But someone who's a Christian is not of the world, Jesus says. A Christian is focused on things above, things that are not seen, eternal things. Christians fear God. Christians love God. Christians seek God's glory. We want to obey and honor God in everything that we do. We resist sin and, and fight against the devil. We follow after Christ. And so if that's the case, if those two things are both true, is it surprising that those two opposing worldviews are going to clash violently with each other? Not at all. What does 1 John 3.13 say? Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Don't be surprised. Or Romans 8, 7 says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Unless the Lord changes the heart, the unsaved person cannot understand the things of God and therefore cannot understand the people of God. And then... It won't take long until the otherworldliness of Jesus in you starts to expose the sin of the unbelievers around you. And just like that, Proverbs 29, 27 comes true. One whose way is straight is an abomination to the wicked. Maybe you've experienced that at work. You try to work heartily as for the Lord. You try to be honest and respectful and diligent. You try not to rob your employer of time or stuff. And you have coworkers who can't understand why you won't compromise. Not even just a little bit. They don't get it. Maybe you've gone through this with friends and neighbors. They can't believe some of the choices that you make. How you spend your money, how you spend your free time, how you parent your children. Why would you give up Sunday mornings on your weekend to be at church? Why would you give from the first of your income toward the work of Jesus? They can't understand it. Or maybe you've even run into this with your family before. When you mention anything related to your faith, the, the antagonism, the hostility, or sometimes even just the, the deafening indifference that you encounter, it's so strong, it blows you away. Why are they so upset? What stirs up their hostility is your otherworldliness. The things that you care about the things that you spend time on, the things that you give to, those are things that set you apart from the world. 
but be very careful here before you start patting yourself on the back too much. Right? Don't get the wrong idea. This isn't because we're so great, is it? No. We don't get any credit. What does Jesus say right there? If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Jesus gets the credit because he's the one who chose you and made you to be different. But the point is, since we remain in the world, even though we have been made to, not, to be not of the world, we're still in it, that means conflict with the world is going to be inevitable. And most of us don't necessarily enjoy conflict. Unless you're weird. I mean, let alone hostility or persecution, right? Most normal people want to be liked, not hated. But you need to see the benefit of being hated by the world like this. Because this that hatred from the world is something that authenticates the credibility of your faith in Jesus Christ. What I'm saying is if the world hates you because you're living out a true Christian faith, that means that things are going exactly according to plan. Jesus tells us that hatred and hostility from the world, that's how they're going to respond to true Christianity. So if people are seeing that in you and responding with hatred... Things are going just like he said they would. But that also means that the opposite is true. Right? So believer, if you are comfortable in the world, or maybe more importantly, if the world is comfortable with you, then I think Jesus' words here give you every reason to be concerned about the legitimacy of the salvation that you claim. James chapter 4 says, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself, listen, an enemy of God. Now, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, we set out to be spiritual jerks to people, right? So that we can come back home and kind of tally up all the persecution that we received. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that true Christianity, it's so otherworldly, it's so radically different, and the, the hostile reaction from the world is so predictable, it's going to happen that when it comes, when it does happen, it verifies the genuineness of your allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ and his work in you. Paul puts it very simply, 2 Timothy 3.12, and indeed all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So how do we prepare ourselves for that? How do we keep the right perspective on that? By realizing, first of all, that the world's supreme hatred is reserved for Jesus Christ. Secondly, by realizing that the world's hatred of us is stirred up by our otherworldliness as followers of Christ. But thirdly, we prepare for persecution by realizing that the world's hatred of us is the result of our relationship with Jesus Christ. The world's hatred of us is a result of our relationship with Jesus Christ. He says in verse 20, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. And he says, remember right there, because he just said this not too long ago, earlier, this same night, back in chapter 13, verse 14. Here's what he said there. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, here it is, a servant is not greater than his master. And it's just an argument from the greater to the lesser, right? It means, uh, if I did this for you, who are you to refuse to do it for others? That's what he's saying. And there, back in chapter 13, with the foot washing, he says it to motivate them toward a greater sense of humility. But here, 
in John 15, he says the same thing, only this time it's to, in, to prepare them to endure hostility. Same words, different agenda. A slave is not greater than his master. So what's the implication of that? If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. You can expect to receive, as a genuine follower of Christ, the same treatment that Jesus received. And, and if you want to know if that's true, as you look through your Bible, all you have to do is just kind of skim through the book of Acts to see this play out. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and, and John are warned and threatened not to preach the gospel. In Acts chapter 5, they're imprisoned for preaching the gospel. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen is martyred for preaching the gospel. In Acts chapter 8, the, the church in Jerusalem suffers great persecution. In Acts chapter 12, James is executed and Peter's thrown into jail. In Acts 14, Paul is stoned and left for dead. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas are in prison. And on and on it goes. And in fact, if you consider the traditional deaths of the apostles, it also makes it very clear. Andrew was crucified. Nathaniel was clubbed to death. Thomas was speared through while praying. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was beheaded by Nero. Thousands upon thousands of Christians were martyred in the early years of the church. And here's the thing that I think we miss. Since the world hasn't changed, and the truth of Christianity hasn't changed, the hatred of the world toward Christians is to be expected in every age, in every place, in every culture. And I realize that in the particular age and place and culture in which we live, we've yet to face the kind of life-threatening persecution that believers in other ages and places have and are experiencing. The fear of torture and execution for our faith is not something we presently have to deal with. And I'm, I'm thankful for that on the one hand, but on the other hand, I'm not totally sure that's a blessing. Because one result of persecution is that those who are phony and fake get out. And those who are real lean closer into Jesus. And just because we presently don't have to fear for our lives because of what we believe, don't be deluded. <laughs> Given the right set of circumstances, even where we live, the unrestrained evil of the world would rise up and resume its hostility toward Christians in ways that we've never experienced and only read about. If Jesus was despised and rejected by men, if he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, yet Jesus was faultlessly perfect, how can we who belong to him expect to be treated any better? A servant is not greater than his master. It's a, re a result of our relationship with Jesus Christ. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Ready for some good news? What did we learn last week? Remember that Jesus has promised us that as we go with the message of the gospel, we will bear fruit. And right here, even in this verse, Jesus says that in the midst of all this hatred from the world, there will be those who respond. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you, but listen to this, if they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Despite all the hostility and persecution, some will be saved, and that is why we go. 2 Timothy 2, 8. Listen to this. Paul writes, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. He's in prison writing this. Then he says, but the word of God is not bound. Listen. Therefore, because of that truth, I endure 
everything for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is why I go, Paul says. This is why I endure everything, because God will save some. So please understand this also, that the world's hatred of Jesus, of God, of Christians, never ever impedes God's plan. It only serves to advance it. So let's wrap this up here with, with three simple conclusions. Number one, persecution is the present destiny of all genuine Christians. Not the final destiny, not the ultimate destiny. Paul says, as, as we read, for this light momentary affliction is preparing us uh, for us an, e uh, an, an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Persecution is not our eternal destiny, but it's our present destiny. It's inevitable. We must understand this. Conclusion number two, persecution is a confirmation of genuine Christianity. It authenticates the real thing. So let me ask you then, if I can meddle a little bit, are you easily identifiable as a Christian? Do you stand out in that way? Or would those that you work with or live near be surprised to know where you're at right now? If you spoke about your faith to them, how shocked would they be? Do you experience any sort of harassment, or even, let's just say, inconvenience, however mild it may be, for what you believe? Because as we've seen here, just as we are to be known for our love for one another, real Christians will also be recognized by the hatred they receive from the world. So if that's happening to you, be encouraged. Take heart. Because it authenticates the reality of what God has done and is doing in your life. And conclusion number three. Persecution is never ever in vain. It's never wasted. We walk in the footsteps of one who is far greater than us. We are simply slaves imitating our master. And we have the comfort of knowing that God sees all of our suffering and that God, God rewards our perseverance through that suffering. And we also here have the encouragement of knowing that not all people will always hate us, but that God will save his own. How? God takes us in our weakness, in our frailness, and through us he uses the message of the gospel to save some. Do you count yourself among those whom he has saved? I'm sure maybe that some of you sitting here this morning maybe tuned me out the moment I started talking. That's okay, that doesn't hurt my feelings any. My, my bigger concern would be, have you tuned out God in your life? Do you, do you want nothing to do with him? Or his people? Or a place like this? Or a message like this? And if that's you, then just please think about this question. What is it that bothers me so much? Why am I so angry at this message of the gospel? Talk to God about that. Or maybe you're here this morning and you identify as a Christian, but you need to be challenged because, frankly, persecution is a foreign word to you. You've never run up against it. You've never encountered it in the slightest way. You're kind of wondering what the big deal is. And I would exhort you to examine yourself. To see whether you are truly in the faith. Maybe you're here this morning and you've realized something about yourself today that you have been part of this world system that has hated Jesus and hated his people. But now God has opened your eyes to the reality of your sin and to your need for a savior. Jesus Christ is the only source of eternal life. You must repent of your sin. You must place your trust in him or else when he returns, you need to be prepared to face him on your terms. Which means you will be judged 
found guilty, and condemned to hell for eternity. But if you ask him to save you, he will. And for some of you, I hope this has clarified that persecution always comes up against genuine Christianity. So don't be surprised when it comes. In fact, persecution serves to verify what God has done in your heart. And in that sense, persecution, suffering, trials, however you want to say it, is a gift of God's grace towards you. It doesn't mean you have to smile when it comes. But you can thank God for how he's using it in your life. We would like to thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. This podcast is a ministry of Victory Baptist Church in Hermiston, Oregon. You can find us at 193 East Main Street in Hermiston, Oregon, 97838, or on the web at yourvictory.org.